The fabled culmination of the Mayan calendar on December 21, 2012, simply failed to deliver the highly anticipated cataclysmic punch that overwrought media hysteria so fervently promised. As well, the destroyer planet Nibiru was another no-show, a reminiscent replay of the false flag Millennium Computer Meltdown Y2K. December 21, 2012 came and went. It was just another day. But despite the distortion, misinterpretation, and outright disinformation, the final chapter of a calculated cycle called the 13th Bacton in Mayan timekeeping, a span measuring 394 years from 1618 to 2012, came to completion, an era of astounding cultural change worldwide, from the conquest of the Americas to the conquest of space, an epic of vast social change but one that did not instantly culminate in one afternoon. With this in mind, perhaps a sober reassessment of Mayan predictions suggests that this time cycle process continues to unfold in a slow, inexorable fashion. But despite the 2012 apocalypse PR sham, incredible cultural change is still upon us. Exponential advances in computer technologies are racing to a nexus point in 2045, when artificial intelligence is predicted to surpass human intellect, a near future where humans may actually become obsolete. Concurrent with technological change, we see a new form of global conquest, where nation-states and constitutional democratic rule are being swiftly eclipsed by expanding corporate conglomerates bent on gaining total manipulative control over the entire human population and the earth itself remains no more stable. For more than 10,000 Japanese, 2011 was the end of the world. And the effects of the Sendai earthquake continue to threaten human health globally thanks to uncontained radiation leakage from the fuming wreck of the Fukushima nuclear reactor. And as of 2013, thanks to global pollution, Major media news reports the highest levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide ever recorded in human history, levels that threaten further increase in catastrophic weather events. So the very specific end of the world 2012 predictions may have been a bust, but as we progress further into the 21st century, human survival on this planet remains no less tenuous. But what of Nibiru, the legendary Planet X? Early in 2011, the approach of a new comet called Elenin stirred a frenzy among Internet enthusiasts convinced the long-anticipated destroyer planet was at last upon us. But as it neared the sun, a solar flare ejection in August disintegrated this fearsome intruder, proving it to be just another mundane ball of rock and ice. This outrageous false alarm seemed to doom the Planet X myth into the urban legend dustbin once and for all. Yet, just as we are about to lay all the failed 2012 hysteria to final rest, recent astounding reversals of Catholic doctrine from high-placed Vatican astronomers may yet again resurrect concerns about the reality of Planet X, otherwise known as Nibiru. For those familiar with the controversial research of Zechariah Sitchin, Nibiru is associated with the fabled 12th planet. According to his study of ancient Sumerian accounts dating back roughly 6,000 years, a large celestial body, roughly the size of Jupiter, swings through our solar system on a 3,600-year cycle. 
a cosmic event that predictably wreaks havoc with the sun's inner planets. The Sumerians claim that what we now know as the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter was in fact once a planet that was obliterated in ancient times by Nibiru's passing. It is also speculated that the Bronze Age Minuan civilization on the Isle of Crete was also devastated as a result of Nibiru's near approach. Scientists speculate this celestial object to be four to five times larger than the Earth and nearly 100 times as dense. It is a failed star, visible only in the infrared spectrum, yet it generates enough emission to warm the seven moons that encircle it. However, as it draws closer to our Sun, an electromagnetic exchange may cause Nibiru to partially ignite with a red glow and a corona discharge, giving it the appearance of fiery wings making it visible in our skies. And according to Sitchin's Sumerian research, at least one of the winged sun's moons is said to be inhabited. Moreover, these legendary extraterrestrials called Anunnaki are alleged to possess a proprietary interest in Earth humanity. Since its inception, over a thousand years ago, the Vatican has vigorously denied the possibility of intelligent life existing elsewhere in the cosmos. The Church originally defined a worldview declaring the Earth was flat and that all the universe revolved around it, elevating the Pope himself to the high pinnacle as God's vicar, custodian of all wisdom and knowledge. Secular challenges to that established orthodoxy have been historically met with severe punishment. In 1600, philosopher Giordano Bruno proclaimed his belief in a plurality of worlds, suggesting the possibility of extraterrestrial life, or aliens. The Church adamantly refuted his theories and burned Bruno as a heretic. In 1615, Galileo dared to challenge Church authority by claiming the Earth was not the center of the universe, but rather that the Earth revolved around the Sun, a theory also condemned as false and contrary to Holy Scripture. In 1632, the Holy Inquisition ordered Galileo to recant his heresies. Ultimately, he was not executed, but he was held under house arrest for the remainder of his life. But here in the early years of the 21st century, we are witness to astounding reversals in the Vatican's orthodox perceptions of universal cosmology. Perhaps to preserve its credibility and minimize the negative social impact of a potential ET revelation, a proactive public dialogue has been recently initiated. In November 2009, the Vatican hosted a conference on astrobiology. Pierre Lena, a French astrophysicist and member of the Pontifical Academy who pressed for the astrobiology conference, clearly stated, Astrobiology is a mature science that says very interesting things that could change the vision humanity has of itself. The Church cannot be indifferent to that. Keynote speaker at the conference, Dr. Chris Impey, astronomer from the University of Arizona, predicted a forthcoming extraterrestrial disclosure, saying the first discovery is only a few years away. And some Vatican scientists are even more explicit in embracing an extraterrestrial reality. Top Vatican astronomer, Brother Guy Consolmagno, states contemporary societies may soon look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. To illustrate the theological soundness of this possibility, Consolmagno argues that humans are not the only intelligent beings God created in the universe, and he says, these non-human life forms are described in the Bible. He starts by pointing to angels and then by referencing the Nephilim, and also quoting John 10:16, which says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Dr. Christopher Corbelly 
vice director of the Vatican Observatory Research Group on Mount Graham until 2012, believes our image of God will have to change if disclosure of alien life is soon revealed by scientists, including the need to evolve from the concept of an anthropocentric God into a broader entity. The late Monsignor Corrado Balducci often appeared on Italian TV to talk about Satanism, religion, and extraterrestrials. As an exorcist, theologian, and member of the Vatican Curia, and friend of the Pope, Balducci went perhaps furthest to state that ETs were not only possible, but already interacting with Earth, and that the Vatican's leaders were aware of it. Balducci flatly stated that extraterrestrial contact is real, and speaking as an official demonologist, he assured that extraterrestrial encounters are not demonic, they are not due to psychological impairment, and they are not a case of entity attachment. But these encounters deserve to be studied carefully. As well, Balducci emphasized, as God's power is limitless, it is not only possible, but also likely that inhabited planets exist. Balducci also shared a personal wish to be the spokesman for these star peoples who are part of God's glory and I will continue to bring it to the attention of the Holy Mother Church. In a paper for the Interdisciplinary Encyclopedia of Religion and Science, Father Giuseppe Tanzella Nitti, an Opus Dei theologian of the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, explains just how we could actually be evangelized during contact with spiritual aliens. As every believer in God would, he argues, greet an extraterrestrial civilization as an extraordinary experience and would be inclined to respect the alien and to recognize that our different species both originate from the same creator. According to Giuseppe, this contact by non-terrestrial intelligence would then offer new possibilities of better understanding the relationship between God and the whole of creation. Giuseppe states this would not immediately oblige the Christian to renounce his own faith in God simply on the basis of the reception of new, unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations, but that such a renunciation could come soon after, as the new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credible. Once the trustworthiness of the information has been verified, the believer would have to reconcile such new information with the truth that he or she already knows and believes on the basis of the revelation of the one and triune God, conducting a re-reading of the gospel inclusive of the new data. Father Jose Funes, a Jesuit astronomer, director of the centuries-old Vatican Observatory, and also a driving force behind the Astrobiology Conference, suggested that the possibility of brother extraterrestrials poses no problem for Catholic theology. As a multiplicity of creatures exist on earth, so there could be other beings also intelligent created by God. This does not conflict with our faith because we cannot put limits on the creative freedom of God. In a 2008 interview, Fune speculated on the question of whether extraterrestrials would need to be redeemed which he believes should not be assumed. God was made man in Jesus to save us, he says. If other intelligent beings exist, it is not said that they would have need of redemption. They could remain in full friendship with their creator. Funis currently heads the VORG, Vatican Observatory Research Group, and just as the new Pope Francis, Father Jose Gabriel Funes is also from Argentina where he entered the Jesuit order. In fact, one of his three examiners was Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, who now reigns as Pope. Funes, who astounded the world with his essay, The Alien is My Brother, is famous for invoking St. Francis of Assisi as an apologetic for accepting ETs. To say it with St. Francis, if we consider some earthly creatures as brothers or sisters, why could we not speak of a brother alien? He would also belong to the creation. In other words, Funis and the Vorg are leading the charge to accept extraterrestrials at face value, even arguing they could be morally superior to humans. 
Author Tom Horn, in his new book, Exo Vaticana, further reveals the position of Father Jose Funes, who states that to not believe in the existence of aliens and be willing to accept their morally superior dogma, that is going to be the true heresy of the future. So you will be a heretic if you are unwilling to accept this morally superior and new form of the gospel. Such dialogues suggest Vatican astronomers are not simply indulging theoretical speculation, but they have a clear perception of an impending extraterrestrial arrival. Could these statements infer the Vatican's knowledge of the approach of a celestial intruder? In 2005, an account allegedly leaked from Vatican intelligence sources tells of a highly classified project codenamed Secretum Omega that involved a joint venture with NASA. In 1995, using the high-altitude space plane Aurora, the Papal State placed an infrared telescope into orbit. Called Zilawe, this telescope was specifically designed to look for Planet X, otherwise known as the fabled Nibiru. It was also revealed that aside from the possible catastrophic effects of this planet's passing, this celestial object is home to a technologically advanced and warlike race. Catholic theologian Father Malachi Martin, a former Jesuit, before his death in 1999, hinted at something like imminent extraterrestrial contact more than once. While on Coast to Coast AM radio in 1997, Art Bell asked Martin why the Vatican was heavily invested in the study of deep space at the Mount Graham Observatory. As a retired professor of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, Martin was uniquely qualified to hold in secret information pertaining to VAT. Martin's answer ignited a firestorm of interest among Christian and secular theologists when he replied, because the mentality amongst those who are at the highest levels of Vatican administration and geopolitics know what's going on in space and what's approaching us could be of great import in the next five years, ten years. Certainly serious Vatican study of astronomical science cannot be denied. Considering its operation of VAT, Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, atop Mount Graham in Wilcox, Arizona. As well, the Vatican has one quarter interest in the new Lucifer binocular telescope on Mount Graham also. State-of-the-art infrared observatories, an explicit dialogue referencing extraterrestrials as our brothers, or moreover our saviors, suggest Jesuit astronomers are preparing for some pending celestial event of major proportions. The Vatican holds spiritual authority over one billion faithful followers worldwide, yet that leadership status has been rocked in recent years by chronic pedophile scandals as well as the recent unprecedented resignation of Pope Benedict. So it seems unthinkable that the Church would abandon age-old dogmas on a whim, with reckless claims about friendly space aliens unless Vatican astronomers were convinced they had rock-solid substantiation. This raises the question of Vatican knowledge concerning Planet X. Public news of an approaching rogue planet first hit the press in 1984. An article in U.S. News and World Report dated September 10th of that year, entitled, Planet X, Is It Really Out There?, stated, Shrouded from the sun's light, mysteriously tugging at the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, is an unseen force that astronomers suspect may be Planet X, a tenth resident of the Earth's celestial neighborhood. Last year, the infrared astronomical satellite, IRIS, circling in a polar orbit 560 miles from Earth, detected heat from an object about 50 billion miles away that is now the subject of intense speculation. Eight years later, NASA released this statement. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. 
In 1991, Dr. Robert S. Harrington, chief astronomer for the Naval Observatory, using a small 8-inch telescope at Black Birch, New Zealand, detected the approach of a suspicious planetary object at an angle of 40 degrees below the ecliptic. In other words, a cosmic intruder that can only be viewed from our extreme southern hemisphere, as its radical orbit swings it closer to our solar system's inner planets. Harrington sent back reports of his ominous discovery, but before he could return to give a formal news conference, he died of esophageal cancer. According to Planet X researcher John DiNardo, Dr. Harrington proved that Planet X was indeed inbound into our solar system. Harrington sent back reports of this ominous discovery, but died of what was reported to be esophageal cancer before he could pack up his telescope and come home to hold what would have been a highly publicized press conference. Even though Dr. Harrington died before he could publicize the fact that Planet X is approaching our solar system, the United States Naval Observatory was appraised of it, as was NASA, yet these government agencies concealed this most earth-shaking discovery in history. Furthermore, in publishing Dr. Harrington's obituary, the United States Naval Observatory went out of its way to gratuitously lie about Dr. Harrington's final achievement, stating that, in his final years, Dr. Harrington had lost interest in the two-century-old astronomical search for Planet X. Dr. Harrington's colleague in the search for Planet X, Dr. Tom Van Flandren, reversed his affirmative statements about the approach of Planet X and became peculiarly silent on the issue. As long ago as December 30, 1983, the Washington Post published a front-page article announcing the discovery by the infrared astronomical satellite IRIS of this very same celestial object, calling it a heavenly body possibly as large as the giant planet Jupiter and possibly so close to Earth that it could be part of our solar system. Yet this great scientific heralding was immediately reversed as the news media fell astoundingly silent and has been silent for the past quarter century. If a massive planet and its entourage were approaching our solar system one quarter century ago and the media chose to conceal it, does this wrecking ball suddenly become a soap bubble? Or does the fear-bred silence of the powers that be suggest that they are desperately protecting their empire of social, political, and economic domination for as long as possible before they duck into their elaborate underground cities in a wishful attempt to survive God's promised wrath now hurtling toward us all? It would seem that despite the general global economic downturn, there is something out in space that world governments are spending a lot of money to keep track of. In 2003, the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched as the world's largest orbiting infrared telescope. In addition, we now have SOFIA, NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. High altitude jumbo jets fitted with onboard telescopes to detect invisible stars. SPT, or South Polar Telescope, is an American microwave tracking telescope recently constructed at the Antarctic to monitor objects not readily observed in the visible spectrum. And nearby, the French have built their new Concordia telescope, allegedly for the purpose of monitoring seismic activity on Jupiter. Could it be mere coincidence that the best vantage point for viewing Nibiru's approach at this time would be the Antarctic, just as Dr. Harrington reported from our extreme southern hemisphere? In December of 2008, the PanStar Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System went online with a telescope constructed on Mount Haleakala on the Hawaiian island of Maui, equipped with the largest digital camera in the world recording 1.4 billion pixels per image. This eye on the sky is specifically designed to seek out potential asteroids or comets that may pose a threat to planet Earth. 
And, as previously mentioned, in April 2010, the latest addition to this family of new observatories, the Lucifer Telescope, commenced operations atop Mount Graham near Wilcox, Arizona. Built by a German-American-Italian consortium, as well as one-quarter Vatican funding, Lucifer joins church-owned Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, VAT, in service atop Mount Graham also. Perhaps aptly named, after the light bearer, Lucifer is the world's largest binocular optical telescope designed to provide unprecedented observation of near-infrared objects. The vast light-gathering power of this telescope will allow astronomers to collect the spectral fingerprints of the faintest and most distant objects in the universe. Yet considering the ominous name of this observatory combined with its infrared technology also suggests serious intent to locate Planet X as well. So while mainstream media continues to supply endless inane distractions to maintain a soothing facade of everyday normality, there are covert signs that suggest the powers that be are clearly aware of the elephant in the room and are ramping up all the resources at their disposal to survive whatever's coming. Back in May 1995, former Defense Department engineer, the late Phil Schneider, revealed, The black budget is a secretive budget that garners 25% of the gross national product of the United States. The black budget currently consumes $1.25 trillion per year. At least this amount is used in black programs, like those concerned with deep underground military bases. Presently, there are 129 deep underground military bases in the United States. In 1994, Hollywood showcased practical application of just such underground shelters with the film Deep Impact, a disaster epic about a comet strike. Is there a connection between the vast amounts of money being spent on both astronomical observatories as well as underground shelters? Deep Impact made explicit reference to shelters built in Missouri. Presently in western Missouri, just south of Springfield, a curious building project is nearing completion. Pinsmore is a mansion under construction in the Ozark Mountains of Highlandville, Missouri. When completed, the home will be the private residence of Stephen T. Huff and his family. It will be one of the largest private single-family residences in the United States. Huff is the chairman of TF Concrete Farming Systems, which is doing the concrete construction work for the home. Huff at one time worked in Army Intelligence and was a CIA officer. Huff later founded Sensor Systems in 1993 and served as its CEO. The company, later known as Overwatch Systems, created leading commercial software products for medical, defense, and intelligence applications. The Stephen T. Huff family applied for a permit in 2008 to begin construction of the mansion. The home is unique as it is insulated concrete form structure that is designed to showcase sustainable construction techniques on a large scale. The home is designed to be earthquake resistant, bulletproof, blast proof, bug resistant, and fire resistant. The structure is capable of withstanding an EF5 tornado a destructive force equal to the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Huff chose the location in Missouri because the state offers a climate that has both warm and cold temperatures, which allows for better testing of the green technologies in the home. Additionally, the rural location of Highlandville was known for lack of construction regulation. The project is not subject to building regulations or building inspections, which would have complicated construction efforts. The mansion is scheduled for completion by 2014. Considering its size, a one-family dwelling only slightly smaller than Buckingham Palace, and unique construction design, it is speculated that Pensmore could usefully serve as a command bunker for continuity of government in the event of some major national catastrophe. 
In 2012, while researching the Pensmore Mansion mystery for his television program, Conspiracy Theory, Jesse Ventura and his investigative team discovered a vast network of underground facilities that honeycombed the mountain beneath Pensmore. Is Stephen Huff's mansion just the tip of a gigantic survival colony iceberg? By strangest coincidence, Western Missouri also holds strategic importance to the Mormon Church. A sacred prophecy states their church will relocate from Salt Lake City and other areas during drastic times to Missouri to build up City of Zion or New Jerusalem in Jackson County, otherwise Independence, Missouri. Mormon Church founder Joseph Smith is also reported to have said that a temple which the Latter-day Saints had planned to build in Jackson County, Missouri will be built in this generation. Could it possibly be coincidental that the same area of Missouri is located upon the North American Craton, which just happens to be the most geologically stable area of the continent. Are these combined facts just odd synchronicities, or do they point to darker possibilities? They seem to bring all new meaning to follow the yellow brick road. Yellow bricks meaning gold or money might lead to the Missouri Ozarks or Oz Ark, Oz being an Illuminati reference to Egyptian god Osiris, where a survival shelter, Ark, is being prepared and preserved for a privileged elite. And why would the privileged elite have need of an Ark? Global masters possessing inside information know that if Nibiru did in fact approach our world, underground shelters would be an imperative for human survival. Certainly close proximity to a dwarf star could generate multiple cataclysms that would seriously test the integrity of any survival bunker. Superstorms packing winds of 300 miles an hour could sweep the lands. Fractured tectonic plates could spawn vast earthquakes. Land masses may collapse into the ocean while new continents appear. Meteors or asteroids from displaced space debris may likely shower the planet as well, or worse, Massive solar ejections triggered by this star's proximity to our sun could induce flares capable of incinerating our planet's entire surface. In short, planet Earth could be ravaged by geological disasters of a biblical scale. And though such catastrophes failed to materialize in 2012, there's no guarantee our future is serenely secured. As recent as 1994, we saw giant Jupiter rocked by multiple strikes of the Shoemaker-Levy Comet, creating explosions which would have qualified as extinction-level events had they targeted the Earth instead. But might the possible near approach of the fabled Nibiru involve more than just global cataclysms? What if it brought humanity face to face with an overwhelmingly superior extraterrestrial civilization, the Anunnaki, the gods themselves? Researcher Jim Mars turned up some curious facts about the 2003 Iraq War. He states, When we decided to invade Iraq in the spring of 2003, we violated normal military tactics, which is to seize an objective, consolidate your winnings, and then move on to the next objective. We simply made a beeline for Baghdad, which is one of the reasons we failed to pacify the countryside. Instead, despite assurances to the World Museum directors by the Pentagon that the Iraqi National Museum would be protected, it was not, and there was wholesale looting. There were guards conveniently missing, and our military had keys to some of the locked vaults. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They bypassed the expensive-looking fakes and went right for the new, uncatalogued stuff. Why would they have such an interest in ancient artifacts? Because this was all coming from the cradle of civilization, the Sumerian civilization. On the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, we find not only accounts of extraterrestrial visitation on this planet, but we also find, perhaps, the secrets of energy manipulation at the atomic and subatomic levels.
According to the Sumerian legends, there was a time when celestial gods openly interacted with earth humans. In fact, modern Homo sapiens is said to be the product of genetic engineering by these same gods. Even the Old Testament book of Genesis makes reference to the Nephilim, godlike beings who came down from the sky. For Vatican astronomers to begin explicitly referencing potential extraterrestrial visitors as saviors suggests they already have a clear perception of exactly who these creatures are. Could these statements infer the Vatican's knowledge that these extraterrestrials are the same gods of ancient Sumer? According to author William Bramley in his book, The Gods of Eden, human beings appear to be a slave race languishing on an isolated planet in a small galaxy. As such, the human race was once a source of labor for an extraterrestrial civilization and still remains a possession today. Custodial rulers knew that they needed to keep spiritual beings permanently attached to human bodies in order to animate those bodies and make them intelligent enough to perform their labors. So while we connect all these suspicious dots, it might do well to include this 1992 channeled warning from an alleged Pleiadian source as well. Over the next number of years, those who come from the skies may not be members of the family of light. Creator gods are coming back to raid you again. They are losing control of the planet. So they are going to come back to their prime portal in the Middle East, where their nest is located beneath the ground to create fear and chaos. One of the huge portals that is presently being fought over is the portal of the Middle East. If you think back over the history of the Earth, you will recognize how many dramas of religion and civilization have been introduced in that portal. The ancient civilization of Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, was a space colony where a certain civilization was introduced. This is a portal that involves manipulation of the human population to serve the needs of others. But could the arrival of alien saviors simply serve a sinister false flag masquerade for this planet's ruling elite to stage a shock and awe grand finale that consolidates their totalitarian rule once and for all? It is certainly well within the realm of possibility that the arrival of space brothers and destroyer planets could effectively serve that agenda. However, it is equally possible that since biblical times, clever extraterrestrials have been using a succession of this planet's ruling elite dynasties to covertly manage the human population. And the grand Anunnaki return spectacle will mark the ultimate success of their meticulously calculated invasion conspiracy. After you had manipulated the population to the point where your covert control over it was complete, you might decide to go overt and let a few ships land in public. But you would not go from covert to overt unless you were sure of the totality of your control. Humanity is not about to be invaded. Humanity is not in the middle of an invasion. Humanity has been invaded, and the invasion is nearly in its final stages. Great invasions do not happen with thundering smoke and nuclear weaponry. That is the mark of an immature society. Great invasions happen in secrecy. The Nibiru mythos offers yet one more scenario of a possible extraterrestrial reality. Definitive proof of either Planet X or off-planet intelligence remains elusive. Implications posed by the evidence shared in this essay are disturbing yet conjectural. But for the moment there is nothing to do but patiently allow the epic changes of the new millennium to simply unfold in their own good time.